Uh, what we have here is a, a group of boar cross does. They're probably boar Spanish crosses. Uh, these are mature, mature does. Uh, probably were brought to the auction because uh, it's getting close to winter time and 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 people are starting to cull their herd. Uh, these goats like this, you know, they do. They probably been been on pasture all their life, so they're not real fleshy. But they, you know, they've been productive. They've all probably all weaned kids this year. Uh, when, when these goats like this come to the auction, uh, usually the Mexico buyers, uh, they, they get on, on these and they buy them and they take them back to Mexico. Uh, some of them go into production. Some of them go into feedlots. Uh, and this time of year, June, July, and August in Texas, uh, we get a lot of the springborn kids that are coming off. We, we've got several groups we've already passed but uh they're uh, you know they're in that 50 to 70 pound 80 pound range and so that's uh, that that's what we're seeing uh there's a good number you know there's a good number of straight spanish goats here today which is you know that's that's basically that's the meat goat of texas we've imported the boars in uh for crossbreeding programs and they cross really well with the with the boar goats, with the, I mean, with the Spanish goats, the Kikos, the Savannas, any of those, um, to add, typically add meat. That's what, that's what these animals are. They're all meat goats. So the more meat we can put on that frame, the better we are. And the boar goat does an awesome job of doing that. Uh, the hardiness, uh, they're not as hardy as the Spanish goats or the Kikos. So that's the reason that's a good cross. The Spanish and Kikos add a lot of hardiness and mothering, mothering ability to these, uh, these kids. Um, the boars put the meat on, so in a commercial setting, uh, you know, that would, that, would be, uh, that would be my recommendation is a, a boar cross, half boar, half Spanish, half boar, half Kiko. Um, Makes make some really nice animals that they'll do well on pasture and they will also the boar gentles them down enough so that they will they do pretty well in a feedlot situation straight spanish goats do not do well in a feedlot situation because uh, they eat and then they just run back and forth so they run a lot of their their finish and their fat off boar goats don't do that boar goats eat and lay down that's their that's their, their two main things so uh but yeah, as far as what we're seeing here, uh, this we got a nice bunch or several nice groups of of goats uh, here today. So. Now, Randy, you said they do well on pasture. Some of these crosses. Mm -hmm. Now that brings to mind green, lush fields. Is that necessarily the case with goats? Uh, it's well, it's not necessarily the case here. Uh, most of our pastures in this area have got a lot of browse, a lot of brush, a lot of forbs, weeds. And that's what the goats prefer. Goats are, you know, there's a misconception that they eat a lot of grass. They really don't eat grass and, until they've eaten all the browse and the, and the weeds up first. Then, then whenever that, that's all that's left, they eat grass. But they're, that's, what, that's what makes goats such a good uh, companion or uh, combination with cattle. Uh, the cattle don't eat the brush, the cattle, they don't eat the, the forbs much, but they eat the grass. So if we've got a, if, if we've got a herd of cattle, we can actually run a comparable amount of goats with them without uh, doing a detriment to our range because they don't compete for the same uh, vegetation. The, the cattle eat, basically eat, the, eat the, the grass, the goats eat the weeds and the and the brush, the, the noxious brush species. If you've, got a, if you've got pastures that are choked up with brush and you can put enough goats in there, they will clean them out for you. Now, in terms of the water consumption, they're, they're quite, a bit, quite, a, quite a bit less than cattle as well, correct? Yeah, I, my understanding, and I, and I don't have the exact figure, I think uh, goats, 
uh, consume somewhere between a gallon and two gallons of water a day. Where cattle, well, they'll consume 20 gallons or more per day. And, uh, you know, so that if you, if you have a, if you're in an area that you have limited water supply, go to a good alternative because uh, you know they, they don't require near as much water. And you know whenever the whenever the vegetation and the forage is lush and green, they require very little water at all. You know they get it from the plants. Now that's a, that's a it's a misconception that cattle are the only things in Texas because here in San Angelo, goats you know small ruminants goats and sheep are huge and have been for quite some time, correct? Yeah, uh, you know San Angelo has been known as the sheep and goat capital of the world since uh, since I can remember back since I was a kid, and you know there. Uh, so that, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a large number of cattle in this area too, but I think that the ranchers uh, in this area, most of these are, are uh, family ranches. Uh, take ours for example, we, the ranch that I'm on right now, we've been in the family for over 100 years, and these are, these are traditional ranching families, uh, sheep and, and cattle always, and then when the goats came about 25 years ago, a lot of us opted to uh, to try them and see how they did, and, and, and in this brush country, they worked really well. Uh, but you know, you can run, you can actually run sheep, cattle, and goats together. Uh, when you when you run the when you're running sheep uh, with cattle and goats, you probably need to cut back your stocking rate on the cattle because they they do actually compete against the cattle for the grasses. They'll eat some forbs, they won't hardly eat any browse, but they eat a lot of grass. So uh, you sheep come along ahead of your cattle and, and eat all their, their grass up before they get to it. So you, you've got to adjust your numbers. Uh, with the goat, it's not, you know, that's not a problem because uh, they're, gonna, they're not going to eat much grass unless that's all that's left. So if in this region you have a nice diverse pool of, of farmers, ranchers, of producers, it's a really nice thing because you can do the collective moment. As we look in here in the auction, we've had quite a few little batches of five and 10 and you know 15 or two even. Yeah, that, 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 that's the case now. And, and, and whenever I was growing up, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, you didn't see, there weren't a lot of small farmers. Everything, when they showed up at the auction, you know, they, they came in trailer loads, you know, three or four or five hundred. Uh, those are still out there, but there's a lot of these little small places. And, and I think this is not only true in Texas. I think it's, uh, I think it's nationwide. Um, and Texas is, you know, one of the last frontiers as far as wide open spaces and big ranches. A lot of your other states don't have those vast expanses of, of, you know, of open grasslands for people to run goats. So they run them on 10 or 15 or 20, 50 acres, and, and uh, so you have to adjust their stocking rate accordingly. We still, we're still fortunate out here that there's, you know, there's, uh, you know, the. Our ranch is about 3,000 acres, and we're surrounded by 20 to 50,000 acre places. So that's, uh, you know, that's kind of the way it is in this area. But you can go small, large, and everything in between in this because the city is behind you here in San Angelo. There's a really great uh, opportunity, and I think they understand it. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we met with the. Uh, uh, the the uh, CEO of the Chamber of Commerce of San Angelo yesterday and the guy, the guy that's the Vice President of Economic Development, uh, they had a huge uh, part, they played a huge part in getting the Double J land plant in to San Angelo whenever they lost their facility up in Colorado, uh, I can't, Mountain States uh, meet up there and they were frantically trying to find a place that they could uh, kill some lambs and uh, slaughter some lambs and some goats. Uh, our uh, Chamber of Commerce president and uh, uh, Vice President of Economic Development, they contacted them and, and had them, they paid for their trip down here to look. But what we had here was a, a plant that was called Rancher's Lamb that was uh, shut down about 15 years ago. Uh, it was a, whenever it was up and running, it was state of the art, uh, fully mechanized, automated, and it's just been sitting for about 15 years and they came in did a lot, had to do a ton of work to it, but they, they got it up and going. Right now they're killing, uh, you know, 12 to 1,500 
sheep per day, I think, and they're looking to ramp up. So, the, but uh, the the Chamber of Commerce was very instrumental in getting that uh, getting that plant uh, open back up here in San Angelo. So, yeah, they the my experience has been with with San Angelo, the city leaders, uh, the 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 county leaders. They're they're very very ag oriented, uh, and, and a lot of the people that sit on the on the chamber and on the different uh, boards and stuff are farm and ranch people. So you know it makes sense that they you know they support their uh, agriculture. You are establishing at this point, or reestablishing, or working on the American Goat Federation, correct? And they have an opportunity for a strategic partnership with the American Boar Goat Association as well, right? Right. Yeah, we're really excited about that. I'm, you know, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but I am president of the American Goat Federation. We've been in existence for about 15 or 16 years. Uh, haven't really done a whole lot until the last uh, five or six, and we. We've really gotten we've gotten a lot of members. Uh, we've since um, Katie has, has been uh, is the director of the American Boar Goat Association. We've kind of struck up a partnership and a friendship where uh, we're going to do a lot of stuff together. And I think that's uh, in the, in these times. I think that anybody that you can team up with that has your same interest, I think it's great. Uh, the Goat Federation. I say we're. We're working on, right now, we're working on what we call the Cattleman's Handbook to Meat Goat Production. And uh, it's, a, it's a guide for cattle uh, men to uh, add meat goats to their, to their operation and diversify. Uh, there are, yeah, there, there are quite a few substantial differences between cattle and, and goats as far as, not so much as far as grazing, but as far as their, their health needs and stuff. Um, there's not a lot of good goat veterinarians. Uh, we're fortunate in this area that we have several. Uh, when you get into the Northeast, uh, most of the uh, most of the veterinarians there don't have not spent any time with goats, and they just treat them like they're little cattle, and that, that really doesn't work as far as keeping them healthy. But yeah, the, the I think the the Cattleman's Guide to Meat Goat is going to be a pretty comprehensive guide that people can look and see what they need in the way of fencing, in the way of predator control, in the way of uh, vaccinations and, and health and, and worming. Par internal parasites are probably the biggest problem that, that people face uh, with boar goats or any kind of goats actually. Uh, if they, because mo most uh, ranchers that I know, especially cattle ranchers, they, they don't worm their cows very often and because they just don't have a problem with the worms. And uh, that's not the case with goats. You get under wet conditions like we've been in, blessed with in San Angelo this year. You know, our average rainfall is normally 18 inches a year. I know we've had over 30 this year already and it, you know, it's only uh, September. So, but whenever you have uh, excess or excessive rainfall like that, it's, uh, the parasites just go crazy and, and you've got to be on top of those if you're not uh, you know and we recommend that you use a FAMACHA chart which is allows you to look at the eyelids of your goats and compare the color of their lids to this chart and it, you know and it, it it gives you specific recommendations based on the the eyelid color and uh, you know we, we, we've used it for several years and it really cut down on our, uh, our having to worm. And, and I'll, I will say that most people that have come from a, a sheep and cattle background, especially sheep, uh, which w was how I was raised, uh, anytime we had the sheep in the pen, it, whether it was uh, uh, shearing or tagging or marking lambs or weaning, anytime we had them in the pen, we just went ahead and wormed them because the hardest part is getting them in the pen and the easy part's worming them. And we did that uh, with our goat operation when we started and what we ended up doing was building some uh, uh, some super worms that were resistant to our wormers so I I, I, uh, I saw a presentation by Dr. Craig from Texas A&M he's probably the premier parasitologist in the country and he said that he he said something that, and this has been probably 30 years ago he said something that really stuck with me and that's it uh, 
10% of your goats carry 90% of your worms, and I find that to be the case. If you can identify that 10% and cull them out, you're going to have not near as many problems with worms. Uh, it's you know it's, and I say that these goats are, they're not difficult to raise as long as you keep your internal parasites down, and you keep them on a good plane of nutrition. Uh, uh, you know they're not that difficult, but the problem is. There's a pretty good learning curve if you go from from no livestock, which is what a, a lot of our goat producers are hobby farmers. They they retired from corporate America and they bought them some property and and they bought a few goats without knowing any, having any idea what they were supposed to do with them. So and that being the case, a lot of times goats have died needlessly because the, the, their owners didn't have a clue what they were supposed to be doing. So that's one reason we're putting together that Cattleman's Guide to Meat Goat Production. Another thing that we're working on right now is to try to put together some regional marketing co-ops that we can bring together a lot of these small hobby farmers. And so, I mean, the, the demand for goat meat is extremely high. It's way exceeds our supply. So we need to get more goats produced in this country. And to do that, you know, like I say, one, the cattle guys are the ones with all the land. So if we can, if we can convince them to raise goats, then we're going to bump our production up considerably. The other is these guys that are just small uh, hobby farmers, they only have one option when they go to sell their goats, and that's go to an auction barn like this that we're looking at today. But if we can establish these re regional marketing co-ops, what we can do is if, say, somebody calls me and wants a thousand head of goats, instead of me having to call a hundred different producers to find those thousand goats, I call the marketing co-op and tell them what I need, and then they get back with me with how many they have, and we can, we can put those, we can, we can fill those orders that way. So, you know, it... We still got a long way to go, but this industry is in its infancy as far as I'm concerned. I mean, these go the boar goats have only been here since 1995, so you know, sheep and cattle have been around for decades and hundreds of years actually. So uh, you know, we're we're finally, I think we're getting a we're getting a handle on what we need to be doing. Uh, the the goat federation and the and the ABGA are really actively promoting and. Uh, what we are, well, the ABJ especially right now, what we're, what we're trying to do is educate our members because we have a lot of people who have no prior livestock experience. They don't know one end of a goat from the other, but they think they're, you know, they're, they're something that they want to do. So we want to try to make their experience as pleasant as possible and try to keep them from, from uh, running into some of the pitfalls. I mean, whenever I started raising boar goats 25 years ago, I, I came from a cattle and, and sheep background, which helped, but uh, the goats are a lot different. You know, they have a lot of different requirements. And, you know, we actually, I, I was fortunate to, to link up with several different people who were, heard, were, you know, really experienced in the boar goat business, and they kept me from making a lot of mistakes. And so that's, that's what I try to do with new, new producers, to, to, is to keep them from making the same mistakes that we did. Now, it's, it's not just a question of how to raise my goat for the educational component. The American Boar Goat Association and the American Goat Federation have the broader picture in mind as well because you're tracking marketing and production and the, both the domestic and the international market potential right now, correct? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're, I think, uh, we, you know, I get a lot of calls or quite a few calls for export of, of goats and of goat meat. But my, I think we need to take care of the demand that we have in the United States first. And that, that you know, once, once we get that taken care of and people are seeing the prices of these goats at the auction barns, at the production sales and stuff, uh, I think there will be more people getting into it. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, you know, it, it, there, there will be, you know, there will be a huge international market. Uh, it's just we we're, we're focuses on focusing on the domestic market at this time because, uh, like I say, our, our demand is so far exceeds our supply that we just need more goats. So, Randy, when you say that there's a good market for them, we are now in well, right at the end of August 2021, and you gave me a. a 
a price point before per pound for a standing, living, breathing goat. What is that right now? Well, uh, after sitting in here at the, at the auction and seeing some of these groups uh, run through, the price is off a little bit, but they're still 250 to 350 a pound. Uh, in the past, you know, I've sold goats from four dollars a pound up to six dollars a pound, and uh, it just depends on the competition at the at the barn at that time. Um, I say I, I think we're we're getting through summer, and there there's a lot of people that are that are moving goats. There's, you know, it's green around here, but there's areas around San Angelo that haven't had the rain. And I got a feeling that that's where a lot of these goats are coming from and from those places that have run out of forage. And so now they're moving them. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, the price has been consistently good for the last three years, four years. And uh, I don't look for that to change as long as, you know, as long as we still have the, the huge demand uh, and, and it exceeds the supply, the prices are gonna be high. It's like, it's just like anything. If you don't, if there's not many of them or not much of it, the price is gonna be high because people are gonna want it and they're gonna pay whatever. So, you know, I think that's just, it's, it's supply and demand. So this is why the American boar goat might be a really, really great component for crossbreeding in other breeds is because it really, it's, it's a meat goat. It packs on meat as, it, as a cross specifically, correct? Exactly. And, and that's the, the, the group that brought the boar goat over here uh, in 1994. That was really their vision uh, was to bring a goat in that was meat and muscle and to cross them with what we had in the way of meat goats, which were Spanish goats and some of the dairy breeds and, and the Kikos and stuff. That was, you know, that was their intention was to get these goats over here and uh, use them in crossbreeding programs. And I, I still think that's what their, uh, that's where their value is. Um, there's been a shift and it, as in most livestock species, there's always a show component, and and uh, and the boar goat have that. So a lot of people are raising raising really pretty fat goats for the show ring, and they're missing out on what they're actually designed for. They're, you know, these are meat goats. You know, even if you even your show goats are going to end up in, on the table sometime. But there's a great opportunity there because if you can capture both sides of that coin. You get the, uh, you have a, an extremely well-rounded goat, so to speak. You've got both the show component, but you also have the meat production, and you can supply not only the market demand, but the people, the, the, the producers. You can, you can attract all kinds, the big guy, the little guy, and everything in between. Yeah, and, and, and I think uh, one, one component that we're losing sight of in the, um, with the boar goat is the fact that we really need to be producing these big, massive, muscular bucks for commercial breeders to use in their crossbred program. Uh, that's something that we've done as long as we've been, you know, I sell, or used to sell between 60 and 100 commercial boar bucks per year. We, we run a lot of goats, but, you know, they came to me because, uh, you know, our goats were, were fast gaining, uh, you know, they were hardy, they were, thick and muscular. We're not seeing a lot of that now because we're seeing more pretty. Exterior covering is just hair. When you share that off, all you have underneath is, is goat and that's where the meat is and that's where we need to focus.